Do you need to find the skills to How would you tell people that this is? You first, first, first. How would you tell this? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on that. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Today we're going to take a look at a talk given by Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins a few years ago at the Institute for Creation Research. In case you don't know about ICR, they're one of the big three in young earth creationism, the other two being Answers in Genesis and Creation Ministries International. ICR was founded by Henry Morris and until very recently was still under the Morris dynasty. Now they're ruled by Randy Galuza I. He takes the very spicy stance that actually natural selection is fake as it turns out. Of course, basically every creationist who isn't getting a paycheck from him, and a few who were, called this out as nonsense. But Randy isn't here today. Today, as I've said, we're here to talk about Jeffrey Tompkins, a PhD in genetics who somehow forgets how to do basic addition in some cases. Often, when it would be convenient for creationists for the math to just, you know, be wrong. Tompkins is the guy who once used a badly bugged computer program to pretend that humans and chimpanzees are less than 90% similar in alignable regions of their genomes. When this was pointed out to him, he fixed that problem and then just failed to do his math right to get a similar result. As far as I know, no correction of his basic math error has ever been issued. But here he's not talking about that specifically. This is going to be a wide range of arguments allegedly debunking evolution and confirming creation. So basically, this is a PhD who gets stumped adding three digit numbers together, who's about to overturn more or less all of science in about an hour. Let's see how it goes. Jeff, take it away. You know, God commands us in his word to, to have an answer, an apologetic answer for these questions of our age. And it says here in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Which part of the Bible tells you that in doing so you should definitely make sure that you just do the math wrong? This man actually added 780 and 634 to get 1,307. For the creationists here who might be fans of Tompkins, the real answer is 1,414. To be fair, that is only an error of 7.6%, which for a creationist is actually not that bad, given that they tend to be off by more like 700,000%. But still, it's just addition. And in this day and age, you need to be ready to defend your faith in regards to uh, evolutionary uh, speculation that people will often hit you with. Or you could join the rest of the Christian world and stop denying obvious reality and more or less all of science. So what about science? Um, well, maybe take a leaf out of the book of Turtle of Hippo, which my audience has assured me is how the name is pronounced. In the literal meaning of Genesis book one, chapter 19, he wrote, usually even a non-Christian knows something about the earth, the heavens, and the other elements of the world about the motion and the orbit of the stars, and even their size and relative positions, about the predictable eclipses of the sun and moon, the cycles of the years and the seasons, and about the kinds of animals, shrubs, stones, and so forth. And this knowledge he holds to as being certain from reason and experience. Now it is a disgraceful and dangerous thing for an infidel to hear a Christian, presumably giving the meaning of Holy Scripture, talking nonsense on these topics. And we should by all means prevent such an embarrassing situation, in which people show up vast ignorance in a Christian and laugh it to scorn. The shame is not so much that the ignorant individual is derided, but that people outside the household of the faith think our sacred writers held such opinions. And to the great loss of those whose salvation we toil, the writers of our scripture are criticized and rejected as unlearned men. If they find a Christian mistaken in a field which they themselves know well and hear him maintaining his foolish opinions about our books, how are they going to believe those books in matters concerning the resurrection of the dead, the hope of eternal life, and the kingdom of heaven, when they think their pages are full of falsehoods on facts which they themselves have learnt from experience and the light of reason? Reckless and incompetent expounders of Holy Scripture being untold trouble and sorrow on their wiser brethren when they are caught in one of the mischievous false opinions and are taken to task by those who are not bound by the authority of our sacred books. For then, to defend their utterly foolish and obviously untrue statements, they will call upon Holy Scripture for proof, and even recite from memory many passages which they think support their position, although they understand neither what they say nor the things about which they make assertion. Does the Bible and what it says support science? I don't particularly care. Scientific evidence does not depend on the Bible or any interpretation of it. Or does it support evolution? Well, you can't support science as a whole without supporting one of its most well-evidenced concepts. So... I guess that's the same question. And is evolution really science? Yes, it is. Even if you disagree with it, the study of evolution is something that is done by scientists who publish their scientific work in scientific journals. That's what makes it science. When people work on it, if they have to use a scientific method and publish in scientific literature. Now don't get me wrong, something being science doesn't automatically make it right. 
When people were looking for the ether wind by testing the speed of light in different directions, the fact that the ether didn't exist doesn't mean that what they were doing wasn't science. But the problem is that if you want to convince the scientific world that a widely held consensus in science is wrong, you have to actually do the work and bring forth disconfirming evidence. And as a pro tip to Tompkins, that usually means you need to get your math right. So maybe next time he writes a paper, he should pass it by a fifth grade math class for them to check his work, because that's the level of education it takes to find his math errors. And so we're going to be talking about that today, and I'm going to show you today that science uh, unequivocally lines up with the scriptures and evolution does not. That's not how those words work. And in fact, God says this in his word. In uh, Romans 1.20 uh, through 22, the apostle Paul said, Okay, I'm done with Bible verses for now. They don't matter to the science. Let's skip ahead until we actually get some claims that aren't just reading from the Bible. So anyways, I want to talk today about three different areas. I want to talk about the origin uh, of life. I want to talk about the fossil record, and I want to talk about human origins. And I'm going to show you how each of these areas completely lines up with what the Bible says. Well, with what Tompkins says it says. Most Christians disagree with him on that. But given that he's a young earth creationist, he better have some amazing evidence ready to discount basically all of genetics, chemistry, astrophysics, etc. So let's start with uh, biological evolution and the timeline the evolutionists will give you if you go to a, a secular university and take classes in evolution. They will tell you that 4.6 billion years ago, the earth uh, somehow magically evolved. No, they won't. And even if they do, they should give you back your money. The Earth accreted. It didn't evolve. Evolution is something that happens to populations of living organisms, and the Earth is a planet, not a living thing. This isn't ego. This isn't Zonoma Sekot. This isn't even one of the brethren moons. Earth is mostly a pile of iron, oxygen, silicon, and magnesium, most of which is not combined into anything organic, let alone living. The total biomass on Earth is about 560 billion tons. The total mass of Earth is 5 sextillion 972 quintillion 190 quadrillion tons. So the living part of Earth comprises roughly 0 0.35 zeros, then a 1, percent of the Earth's mass. Does that sound like the kind of thing that can reasonably be said to be a population of living things that can evolve? No, and that's of course ignoring the fact that before life, you know, there'd be zero tons of biomass on Earth, because that's how logic works. Oh wait, I forgot. Tompkins doesn't understand math. Anyway, the Earth didn't evolve and there wasn't magic. In a cloud of particles in space, gravity and the conservation of momentum will cause the particles to combine in places where there is slightly higher density, and they will cause the particles to line up pretty close to the plane defined by the aggregate angular velocity. Similarly, because in any gravitational interaction, interactions that bring objects closer to that plane are more likely than those that bring them farther from that plane. And when I say this isn't magic, I mean you can just simulate this yourself with a cheap computer program. 30 bucks US will get you Universe Sandbox, which is more than capable of running a gravity simulation of a protoplanetary disk where you can just watch planets form without any magic, just an n-body stepwise gravity simulation. On the other hand, God poofing a planet into existence ex nihilo sounds a whole lot like a conjuration spell from an RPG. 3.6 billion years ago, the first cells then somehow appeared uh, spontaneously on Earth. I feel like we're using the word spontaneously to imply something unusual. All it really means in this context is that it wasn't directed by some outside agent. For example, the sun spontaneously emits heat and light. It's probably not time to get into a long discussion about abiogenesis anyway. And then three to six million years ago, which would just be a blink in the eye uh, of evolutionary time, humans evolved from a common ancestor with apes. That ancestor was itself an ape by any rigorous definition one could give to the word ape. And so I actually prefer the on-screen simpler wording of humans evolved from apes. And every single bit of this was due to time, lots of it, chance, and random processes. And also non-random processes. As a rule, things like gravity and chemistry aren't random, hence why we can simulate them and also reliably experiment on them. Also, because I know people will ask about it if I don't mention it, yes, the slide has random used as another noun in a list, even though it's clearly just an adjective applied to the word processes, and so it shouldn't have the comma after it. I don't care too much. Typos happen. So what is this biological model of evolution that, that is being pushed? Well, first of all, you need to have chemicals that are, that are biologically significant um, form in some sort of a primordial soup. Well, if by soup we're just meaning any chemical system with organic chemistry that's prebiotic, then sure. It's not really a term that's still in use in origin of life research, but as long as we aren't pretending that 
the primordial soup is on its own some kind of model, then I'm okay with the term. But it should also be noted that experiments have shown that many important organic chemicals can indeed form spontaneously in prebiotically relevant contexts, including amino acids, polymers, RNA chains, and sugars. These chemicals then need to polymerize or bond together to form uh, biomolecules that actually are information rich. Wow, if only James Farish hadn't already shown in 2005 that RNA can polymerize when exposed to Montmorillonite clay. Whoopsie. And then these molecules somehow are supposed to have magically come together to form cells. Well, we're skipping some steps like autocatalytic cycles, lipid bilayers that can form spontaneously, natural chemical selection for stability, etc. And then these single cells then over millions uh, of years evolved into multicellular creatures, into all the plants and animals uh, that you see on the earth today. I wonder if perhaps we could test that by getting some single-celled algae that, as far as we can tell, have no multicellular ancestors, and getting them to evolve obligate hereditary multicellularity. Oh wait, not only can we test this, it's already been tested and it turns out that, yeah, multicellularity actually evolves fairly easily. In fact, a group of researchers reported being able to do just that in 2019 after exposing Chlamydiomonas reinhardti to predation by Paramecium tetraralia after about 750 generations. This step isn't magical. Humans have watched it happen in real time. And so anyways, this is the basic uh, evolutionary story. The fact of the matter is there's only two ways, there's only two options as to where uh, life came from. Life either evolved by natural processes, and once again, time and chance and random processes, which you can call materialism. Yeah, you can call it that if you're an idiot like Tompkins is. Materialism in the philosophical sense is the belief that only material things exist. Whether or not life originated in a way that can be explained in a materialist manner says nothing about the truth of philosophical materialism. Philosophical supernaturalists believe in material causes for things all the time. I doubt that Tompkins thinks that when he decides to go make some scrambled eggs that the stove gets hot because a demon is there heating up the burner. Or that the eggs were laid by a ghost chicken. Tompkins is welcome to join the majority of theists around the world in not rejecting science, but also believing in the supernatural. And somehow that created life, or life was created by a creator. There really are no other options here. Either life created itself, or a creator created life. So what does the evidence point to? Oh, way to set up abiogenesis in intentionally misleading terms as life creating itself. That presupposes that life was around before abiogenesis, making the whole thing silly. No, life didn't create itself, it was created by organic but abiotic chemistry. Notice how much less silly it seems when you phrase it a more accurate way. But also, the real dichotomy is in fact between life being created by some mind or not. And that's fair enough, that is a dichotomy. Well, evolutionists tried to start uh, by creating the basic biomolecules that supposedly would have led to life. And they were trying to simulate some sort of a primordial soup where these, these chemicals magically uh, appeared and came together. And to do this, they had to use a highly engineered contraption. <laughs> so this was... Ha ha ha! You see, creationists like to complain that nothing about evolution or abiogenesis can be studied in a lab. But when you show them some experiment about some aspect of abiogenesis, they can just say it doesn't count because someone had to contrive that experiment as if all laboratory experiments aren't both contrived and also still investigating the natural world. Honestly, it's astounding how intellectually dishonest this is. This would not really be representing uh, really early life on the Earth, but really man's ingenuity. But anyways, this is about the closest they actually came to creating the chemicals that you need for life. Yeah, in the last 70 years, a Miller-Urey experiment is the closest anyone has come to making chemicals important for abiogenesis in prebiotically relevant ways. Except, oh, wait. I've already mentioned a more recent example that went way farther than that by actually getting RNA polymers. Nice to know that in addition to being demonstrably worse at math than a fifth grader, Tompkins is just outright lying. He's either lying that he knows better, or he's lying by presenting himself as someone who knows what he's talking about when he knows full well he hasn't checked the literature on this. So in this, in this uh, contraption, basically you had water and um, ammonia that was boiling there, and then the vapor... Uh, from that went up through a tube and then it went into a chamber or an electrode um, was basically charged across these, uh, these gases. And then uh, the compounds were then condensed and then in, at a trap at the bottom of this contraption, then you could pull off these chemicals. The problem is, is if you let everything keep cycling around in a circle, 
you would destroy the chemicals as fast as you made them. So they had to have this trap uh, at a bottom. So, so this is supposed to have been simulating chemical processes in seas and lakes on early Earth, where chemical products of lightning strikes can dissipate into large bodies of water where they can undergo further chemical reactions. In that scenario, you don't really have to worry much about subsequent lightning destroying the chemicals produced because, well, they won't stay near the lightning strike. But when you're using a small glass flask and a spark plug, you don't really have that option. Anyways, they claim that this engineered contraption somehow represented a, a crude uh, pool in the primordial <laughs> earth where life somehow magically got started, supposedly maybe by lightning strikes. Uh, zapping the pool or something like that. So, no, they claim that they were investigating the abiotic synthesis of amino acids under prebiotically plausible conditions, something which had never been done before. Up until this point, amino acids were thought to be created without life, but no one had actually seen it happen. In the seven decades or so since, we've come a fair ways, and now amino acid synthesis, per se, is not really seen as a problem anymore. Uh, there was a lot of problems with this experiment, and first of all, they were only able to create very small, minuscule amounts of the very simplest amino acids needed for life. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, and proteins are kind of the powerhouses uh, in your cell that, that do a lot of the work. Right, meaning that the experiment was a smashing success because it did what it set out to do demonstrate the validity of the possibility of abiotic synthesis of amino acids. It was never designed to create life. That wasn't even a goal. They, but another problem was not only did they create extremely small amounts of these amino acids, but they were both left and right-handed versions. Well, molecules, just like your hands, are the same, but, but, but are, but are uh, stereoisomers of each other. Chemical molecules like amino acids can be either left-handed or right-handed as well. But the problem is your body and the, and the cells of living things only use left-handed amino acids. So this contraption actually uh, created a mixture of both left and right-handed. That's true. It did. I wonder if this is a problem that would have been worked on sometime in the last almost a century. Oh wait, it has. In 2013, Prakash Joshi et al. reported that, in fact, our old friend Montmorillonite not only helps with the synthesis of RNA, but also facilitates homochiral selection. In 2009, Ronald Breslow found that in solutions with even slight excess of either-handedness, which can occur pre prebiotically, increase that imbalance, allowing for a greater solubility of the amino acids, which can be selected for. How life ended up with homochiral biomolecules is still an open question, but to pretend that we haven't made any progress in 70 years is just a lie. There are now plausible, if not fully confirmed, mechanisms that were unknown when the Miller-Urey experiment was conducted. What Tompkins is doing here is like him complaining about TVs because they are so small but bulky and don't even display any color because the last time he checked on TV technology was 1952. Hey Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. We have giant flat screen plasma TVs with full color and high dynamic range now. It's been, you know, a few years. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the experimental conditions destroyed the molecules uh, as fast as it made them. And as I described, that doesn't matter because the place this chemistry would have gone on in, in the wild, was not a tiny flask, but at the smallest, a lake. But the thing is, is that we have a chicken and an egg kind of situation going on. But it's actually worse than what came first, the chicken or the egg, because you need DNA to code for protein, and from the DNA, an RNA copy is made that basically is the template for the protein. Well, that's how life works now, yes, but RNA can and does form spontaneously. RNA can make copies of itself as well as make proteins all on its own, and DNA was probably not present in the first life. RNA comes first, and it demonstrably does not need DNA to be a template for it. And so in other words, you need RNA and DNA to create proteins, but you also need proteins or these machines to copy DNA and to replicate DNA and to make RNA. So all of these things, DNA, RNA, and proteins are all dependent on each other. So it's a three-way situation that's worse than just say a chicken or an egg two-way situation. You need all of these things coming together at the right time inside a cell for life not just a few random amino acids popping up in some primordial soup. Uh, no. 
And of course, evolutionists themselves have, have recognized this problem. Sir Fred Hoyle was a famous astronomist. It's astronomer, not astronomist. Who calculated uh, the actual odds of a protein, a single protein arising by chance, and that was 1 in 10 to the 40 thousandths. And he actually said that that was the same chance for a tornado to sweep through a junkyard and leave behind a Boeing 747 uh, fuel of full of fuel and ready to fly. So those are just the odds of getting a simple protein coming together through random processes are basically impossible. Well, good thing chemistry isn't random then, isn't it? And since it's not random, when we actually have experiments showing that many possible options for abiogenesis are plausible, his meaningless calculations are just that, meaningless. And of course, his calculations also ignored selection, which can and does happen in chemicals. If you wanted randomness to create a plane, that's actually not impossible. One can create vehicles and engineering software via genetic algorithms, which are essentially a computing analog to biological evolution, and they are in fact used to design things in the real world. They take what starts out as essentially random code, have a selection criterion, or a few weighted criteria, and then through generations of mutation, selection, and then further mutation of the best performing codes, you can indeed design an airplane. Hoyle, who was an odd duck in being a staunch atheist but also a strict anti-evolutionist, picked perhaps the worst analogy for life imaginable, a designed non-reproducing object. It's the same mistake William Paley made with his watch. But you know how I mentioned that life requires DNA, RNA, and proteins? Yes, I remember how he lied about that. To get going, it's actually even worse than that, because you need lipids to create membranes to basically form uh, the boundary uh, for the cell or the cell membrane Lipids spontaneously form bilayer capsules that are essentially the radically simplified version of a cell membrane just by existing. If they have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic end, then they'll arrange themselves that way simply because of the forces acting on them. Again, how they become associated with other parts of living things such as RNA is currently an open question, but pointing out that something is an open question is really the same as saying it can't happen. For example, I don't know how to build a rover that could roam around the moon Titan, but that doesn't make it impossible to do. I'm not even sure anyone knows how. But I know there are people with a better idea than me, but even if we went back a thousand years to when no one knew Titan even existed, the ignorance doesn't make that impossible. Similarly, even in 1952, when what Tompkins seems to think was the one and only experiment in the origin of life studies was conducted, the fact that we then didn't know about RNA polymerization in clay didn't make spontaneous RNA polymerization impossible. To enclose everything within the cell, you need carbohydrates in the cell for basic metabolism, for signaling, for, for forming a cell wall, say in, in plants or fungi or bacteria which have cell walls, animals don't. None of that is required for any life, and the first life probably didn't have cell walls or carbohydrates beyond the most simple ones. Pro tip, if you're pointing out that something like cell walls are important to some organisms but not others, that means we don't need to account for it when studying the first life, because apparently the first life didn't need to have those things. Further, the first ever living cell was radically more simple than any bacterium alive today. Bacteria are the products of billions of years of evolution, as is all other life. So while bacteria may seem small and simple relative to, say, eukaryotes, or even macroscopic organisms, remember that they're vastly more complicated still than what we might first be able to call a living organism. And so basically, it's even more complex than just needing DNA, RNA, or proteins. Yes, modern life is far more complex than what could likely emerge from prebiotic conditions. Good thing that no one is proposing that that's what happened. Rather, this complexity arose over the course of billions of years. But it's amazing the faith uh, that some evolutionists have. And this is a guy who is fairly famous. His name's David Deemer. And he has made a career out of trying to figure out how life might have got going randomly on its own. And he actually poured what he thought were all the basic essential chemicals that you would need to build a cell, including lipids, mixed them up in a beaker, and then went and poured them in a mud puddle, thinking he was going to get life. Well, I think we could all, most of us in here, <laughs> could tell him what he would get. You know, absolutely nothing. Well, yeah. First, life didn't start by just pouring a bunch of chemicals in a puddle. No one thinks that, and he wasn't trying to get life. He was testing how chemicals adhere to the specific kinds of clay in not just some puddle, but geothermal pools. Turns out that in this case, the chemicals bonded more tightly than expected to the clay, making them unavailable for future reactions, which may have been a disappointment for Dr. Deemer, but it's not exactly some big blow to the whole field of abiogenesis research. Negative results are important, and they rule out possibilities. 
But anyways, he says this in this book, uh, which I actually have in my office, and he says the results are surprising and in some ways disappointing. It seems that hot, acidic waters containing clay do not provide the right conditions for chemicals to assemble themselves into pioneer organisms. Yep, good thing that isn't the one and only option. But also, it's nice that Tompkins has stopped pretending that origin of life experiments stopped in 1952. So, in other words, he put, just assuming all these chemicals magically popped into existence somewhere in the deep primordial past, he actually put them all together in the same beaker, which is, you know, not reality, but then on top of that, poured it into a mud puddle thinking he was going to get life and was surprised nothing happened. How much more blatantly can you lie about this? And of course, no experiment is reality. Reality doesn't have controls. Reality is messy. You do experiments precisely because they don't have all the problems of reality. The fact that at one point creationists will complain that nothing about evolution can be examined in a lab, so it's not science, but then at a different time, they'll say that laboratory experiments don't count because they aren't the same as what happens outside of a lab, as if that weren't part of the point. If there were ever a better way to show that creationists, by and large, do not care about science, evidence, or truth, I can't imagine what it would be. Well, let me give you some more quotes uh, from evolutionists who have recognized the serious problem for, for where life came from. Harold Morowitz, who was a biophysicist, tried to figure out the chance of a bacterium resulting by the chance combining of pre-existent building blocks, much what David Deemer did in that previous slide I showed, coming together to form a cell, and he, it was one chance in 10 to the 100 uh, what is that, one billion? <laughs> yes, it is a billion. Nice that we have yet another example of the fact that Dr. Tompkins struggles with fifth grade math. So I guess Harold Morowitz must have been a huge skeptic about abiogenesis, and his work probably presents problems for such occurrences, right? I mean, otherwise this would just be, well, not even a quote mine, but still an out-of-context reporting of a conclusion Dr. Morowitz reached. Well, let's read a section from his wiki page, since that will be more than enough to show what Dr. Morowitz was on about. Quote, Morowitz's book Energy Flow in Biology laid out his central thesis that energy that flows through a system acts to organize that system. An insight later quoted on the inside cover of The Last Whole Earth Catalog, he was a vigorous proponent of the view that life on Earth emerged deterministically from the laws of chemistry and physics, and so believed it highly probable that life exists widely in the universe. In 1981, he testified at McLean v. Arkansas that creationism has no scientific basis and so should not be taught in science in public schools. End quote. So it's pretty clear that the reason Morowitz provided this astounding figure is because he was trying to show that stochastic accounts for the origin of life probably don't work, and that his more deterministic outlook did. In no way was he proposing that there was some barrier to abiogenesis. Indeed, he pushed forward research showing that abiogenesis is in fact plausible, and he thought it so plausible that he expected at least simple life to be found anywhere it could exist in the universe. Now, I personally think that life is probably less common than he expected, but to reference Dr. Morowitz as a skeptic of abiogenesis or someone who put forward problems for it, once again, is deeply dishonest. Am I the only one getting exhausted by pointing out all the times that creationists will just lie about almost anything to pretend that their view of the history of the universe is anything but completely wrong on the face of it? It's one thing to believe something silly. Most people do. Whether it be that cops are there to serve and protect or that humans aren't apes. But it's an entirely different thing to not only believe that, but to spread it by telling obvious falsehoods to uninformed people who trust you because of their previous religious bias. One of those is unfortunate. The other is plain old evil. Yes, I'm calling Jeffrey Tompkins an evil person. I'm honestly not sure what else can be said. He is actively retarding the scientific literacy of the world and lying to do so. He has bad aims and is using bad means to achieve them. Sure, he's not Pol Pot, but it's hard for me to see any way in which I can conclude that he is not actively and intentionally making the world worse. Sir Bernard Lovell, an astronomer, uh, in his in the center of immensities, basically said uh, it was effectively zero. Oh, a reference to a 1978 book that doesn't seem to be publicly available. Literally the only place I can find this is in a list of quotes from creationists. Given the long and well-documented history of creationists failing to go back to the original source and thereby just perpetuating not only just out-of-context quotes, but actually incorrect quotations, I have no way to say that this is even something he said or implied, or in what context he did so. 
but I can say that 1978 is a pretty old source to be using for such a rapidly progressing field as Origin of Life. Also, I think it's fair to point out that what an astronomer says about such subjects outside his field is about as important as what any other intelligent but non-expert layperson says about it. And Francis Crick, who was one of the guys who discovered the structure of, of DNA back in the 1950s, said... Does anyone remember when this talk was supposed to be about evolution? Because I remember that. Here's a fun thing. If abiogenesis is impossible without a miracle, it does literally nothing to change biological evolution, which doesn't start until after we have living things. Just like if the universe couldn't come into existence without a miracle, it does nothing to say that abiogenesis needed one or to disconfirm evolution. Life itself, in, in its origin or nature, it can never have been synthesized at all any time. Oh great, a 42-year-old book I also don't have access to and can't even find this quote among the list of creationist quote mines. So I guess I'll just have to go based off Crick's general views. Fortunately, this time, we don't really have to go into his weird and very obviously wrong race realism nonsense. Although, odd that the totally not racist Institute for Creation Research would quote a famously racist scientist, but either way, that's not the point. Crick was working at a time when ribozymes had not been discovered, and he thought that the only enzymes on Earth were proteins. As a result, he doubted that Earth life could have begun on its own, and so he favored a directed panspermia, which would allow Earth life to have been engineered in this confusingly paradoxical way. So I guess we could say that he was sympathetic to intelligent design, although he was a staunch anti-creationist. Turns out that ribozymes do exist, so his major objection to abiogenesis is simply not a problem today. So even evolutionists have recognized that, that where did life come from? Basically, it's, it's a huge problem uh, with basically a 0% probability of even happening. Weird how we didn't get any scientists from, say, the last decade or so who are in the field saying that. Probably because now that we have decades more work on it, scientists really aren't pessimistic about it. But let's just assume life came into existence magically and evolution got on its way. So we're rejecting abiogenesis in favor of magic. That's a pretty typical creationist thing to do, and since abiogenesis is not a closed question, for now I guess I'm willing to just go with assuming God did it as a miracle or something, and then move on to evolution. The thing that the whole talk was supposed to be about in the first place. Uh, evolutionists would tell you that you are an animal and that you share a common heritage with earthworms. Well, humans are definitely multicellular eukaryotes with no cell walls and an internal digestive system. So yeah, humans are definitively animals. And yes, humans share ancestry with earthworms, as that's sort of what the universal part of universal common ancestry means. And this is basically a quote from a basic biology textbook. So this whole idea of life evolving from, from simple to complex actually got going by Charles Darwin, who, who tried to represent it in a tree form. And he was one of the first people to basically develop these evolutionary trees and promote them. So this is basically the concept of evolution, that, that, or the highly theoretical concept of evolution, that you would have single-celled creatures at the base of life and then as evolution progressed, you would begin getting plants on one branch of things, and then animals on the other, and then fish and mammals and so on. And the evolution should form this nice, uh, neat uh, evolutionary tree. Well, things like incomplete lineage sorting and horizontal gene transfer can certainly muddy up the nice, neat splitting that ideally we could see. Turns out that biology is messy. And so there's the evolutionary tree where you just got basic groups of animals kind of broken down. But that's not really what we see at all when we look at life today and when we look at the fossil record, which we'll talk about more in a bit. We actually see clusters of things. Well, yeah, given that radiations are a thing, both according to evolution and creationism, we should expect that we should have clusters of very similar organisms. But to pretend that we don't have anything linking these clusters is just a lie. And that means it's that time again. Hallelujah, 
And that's exactly what the Bible tells us, that everything was created after its kind and that its seed is in itself and it only reproduces after its kind. And so humans only make more humans, dogs only make more dogs, and frogs only make more frogs, and roses are just roses. Which, given that it's in line with monophyly, isn't something that is not what evolution would say. When the first bilaterians evolved, they didn't stop being eumetazoans. When the first deuterostomes evolved, they didn't stop being bilaterians. When the first chordates evolved, they didn't stop being bilaterians. When the first vertebrates evolved, they didn't stop being chordates. When the first bony fish evolved, they didn't stop being vertebrates. When the first tetrapods evolved, they didn't stop being osteichthians. When the first amniotes evolved, they didn't stop being tetrapods. When the first synapsids evolved, they didn't stop being amniotes. When the first mammals evolved, they didn't stop being synapsids. When the first primate evolved, they didn't stop being mammals. When the first simiaforms evolved, they didn't stop being primates. When the first apes evolved, they didn't stop being monkeys. And when the first humans evolved, they didn't stop being apes. Evolution is about branching, not just completely separating oneself from one's ancestors. That's not how this works. Roses will always and forever produce roses, even if in the future they become unrecognizable. Similarly, even if the future of all tomorrows comes to pass and we have post-human species inhabiting myriad worlds all distinct in their morphology, they will still be humans. We never see one fundamental type of creature evolving or changing into a new one. Because that would violate the principles of evolutionary biology as they are currently understood. Why is it that even PhD level creationists always want as evidence for evolution things that would invalidate evolution? It's like asking to see Jesus' bones to demonstrate the truth of Christianity, despite the fact that the whole point is that he didn't stay dead and isn't dead now. You shouldn't be able to find his bones if Christianity is true. And of course the scriptures are quite accurate on that. So do we actually see an evolutionary tree when we look at, at biological life across the spectrum? Yes, that's why even the creationist Carolus Linnaeus, who invented the traditional taxonomic system that's still in use today, albeit with modifications, and the acknowledgement that the ranks are fundamentally arbitrary and cannot be compared across taxa, found, to his befuddlement, that life fit into a nested hierarchy, despite what would be predicted based on a design hypothesis, which would be that life should really be grouped according to basic ecological niche. There's no reason to suspect that animals fulfilling the deer niche in Europe and in Australia should be so radically different as the deer and kangaroo. And yet, here we are. And this happens all over the place. There's no a priori reason to suspect based on design that dolphins should be more similar to cows than to either horses or sharks. And yet, they are. And then, when Darwin discovered that yes, this tree was what it looked like, the history of life on Earth, that was spectacularly confirmed after it was discovered how inheritance works and after the genomes of various species could be examined. This too fit into the same nested pattern that we see in morphology and not just in the part of the genome needed for common function. For example, we should expect that, say, for any one widely spread protein that has an important function, that the genes for such a protein should be pretty similar across the board. But what about in the neutral variations, such as synonymous codons? Or what about the pattern of endogenous retroviral insertions? This is where a virus has inserted its genetic code into an organism, but for one reason or another, it no longer actually makes the cell produce more viruses. There's no reason apart from common ancestry for these to form a nested hierarchy, and yet, they do. Everything you can possibly think of that could be used to test common ancestry, as predicted by evolutionary biology, has been tested, and the common ancestry hypothesis is overwhelmingly confirmed, with the interesting exception of viruses taken as a group. And here we don't see a nested hierarchy. Some have single-stranded genomes, some use DNA, some RNA. They have vastly different capsules, some insert their genetics into the host DNA, some just directly hijack ribosomes, and there is no hierarchy in their genomes. This is what we should expect to see if things do not share common ancestry, as viruses do not. Some may have been cells, some may have been bits of detached genetic material, some may have simply co-evolved with cellular life as non-cellular parasites. I don't know how much more firmly I can drive home the fact that we actually do see the tree of life in organisms, and how we can actually distinguish that from separate ancestry, which we also see in biology. No, we don't. We see what a lot of creationists would call a creation orchard. Except we don't, because we know what that would look like. It would look like what viruses look like. That's why there are known top levels of virus taxonomy that you can't really go above. But if you take, say, animals, because let's face it, 
most people out there don't really care about plants, even though they are cool. If we look at what most creationists give us as their putative kinds, they are in most cases simply taxonomic families. Well, there are a few problems here, the first and most obvious being that there's no such thing as a family. There are groups that have been traditionally given that label, but there's no way to say that the beetle family Carabidae is the same kind of thing as the Hymenopteran family Myrmicidae, even less the reptile family Varanidae. These things can't be compared as the same level of taxonomy in any meaningful way. A family is just a group of similar genera and how similar they need to be is fundamentally arbitrary. The second big problem is that there are obviously higher taxonomic groupings that are no more or less arbitrary than family, but importantly, also no more or less well-supported than them. Most people could notice that Giraffidae, Antilocapridae, Bovidae, and Moscidae are all ruminants, and that with animals like the suids, the tiosuids, and camelids, they make up artiodactyla, which are ungulates, and that ungulates are mammals, and that mammals are vertebrates. Why stop at family for common ancestry? The reasons we unite all of Bovidae into a single family are the same reasons we lump them with Giraffidae into the ruminants, and with camels into Artiodactyla. The creationist orchard is just taking taxonomy, picking an arbitrary point based on an arbitrary signpost, and then declaring that that's where common ancestry cuts off. It's like reading a book and just arbitrarily deciding that only the even chapters count. You're just missing a huge portion of the science here, and for no easily justifiable reason. Ironically, where we do see an orchard, viruses and similar parasites like prions and viroids, is where creationists don't much like to talk about what's going on. Maybe it's because they think it violates their ideas of a benevolent god or because people don't like viruses, but the part of biology that most closely matches the claims of creationism is virology. Why aren't we seeing creationists trying to apply the lessons in separate ancestry from viruses to animals? Is it because while viruses obviously do not share common ancestry as viruses, that animals do? In other words, we see branches uh, of life like humans with a lot of variation in them or dogs with a lot of variation in them, but we don't see any ab evolutionary precursors leading up to these types of creatures. Oh good, it's time for a slideshow. And keep in mind that there are far more than what I have in the slideshow. It's just that not all of them have easy to find pictures of the fossils. <laughs> Nor do we see these creatures evolving or changing into something else. Yes, we do. In fact, just the orchard has that. If it has any splits at all, then we are seeing organisms evolving into something new. Now, what that new thing is isn't going to be radically different from what it was before the split, but that's rather the point. Evolution means diversity increases over time, but it also means that if you look at the evolution in one lineage in a relatively short amount of time, you won't see huge amounts of change. But still, just the fact that the orchard model has the same kind of splitting evolution puts below the trunks of the orchard is prima facie evidence that evolution is occurring. That's why for so long creationists railed against things like the evolution of the giraffe or the horse. But now most creationists say that since the kind is at the family level, these things probably really happen, and that equid and giraffid fossils probably do represent ancient relatives of the modern animals that are all descended from a common ancestor. But in the, in the, the, the Darwinian evolutionary model, which being a century and a half old is not the current model in evolutionary biology. This is how it supposedly uh, is supposed to work. You would get mutation, in other words, there would be errors in the DNA, and then somehow those errors would magically create new, important, and useful information, and then nature would magically somehow select that individual with that improved uh, mutation, and then over billions of years, you would get evolution. 
Well, there's certainly a lot to unpack here. First, let's not pretend that the scientific explanation is the magical one, where the direct magic from God explanation is the naturalistic one. Next, let's take a look at the idea of information. Tompkins, like all of his ilk, is loath to give any kind of definition for information that would allow us to measure how much information is in any given organism, compare this amount between organisms, or determine if a mutation has increased, decreased, or done neither to the information in the organism's genome. So we'll ignore the information thing unless he is willing to propose some way that anyone, creationist or otherwise, could even begin to assess the claim. But the broader claim about mutation is that it doesn't really help, because it can't produce novel functions. To this, I present the Antarctic ice fish. This animal lives in the southern oceans in conditions well below freezing where most fish similar to it could not survive because ice crystals would form in their cells, killing them. They have a gene for something called antifreeze glycoprotein, and the exact chemistry and mechanism of the protein is not really important, but the study I'm referencing is Molecular Ecophysiology of the Antarctic Notothenioid Fishes by C. H. Christina Chang and W. William Dietrich. Not sure if I pronounced that last surname correctly. It was published on the 21st of May 2007 in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society and is linked in the description if you want more information. So why am I bringing this up? Well, because interestingly, we can actually trace the mutations that happen to create this protein out of a trypsinogen protein. As the name implies, trypsinogen is a protein that when activated forms trypsin, an important enzyme for the metabolism of proteins in the pancreas. It is stored in this inactive form because if it were stored as trypsin, the active form would be destructive to the proteins of the pancreas, so it's only activated as necessary. Anyway, the antifreeze glycoprotein in the ice fish is actually derived from a part of the trypsinogen gene that was duplicated by mutation and then subsequently further mutated, giving it new function. We know precisely which mutations happened, and we can see what was once a protein to digest other proteins has now become a protein that keeps ice crystals from forming inside ice fish cells. But also the fish retain the original protein, and so can keep performing protein digestion. If this isn't mutation leading to new function, and presumably therefore new information, then I don't know what could possibly count as mutation doing so. And I suspect that it will be rejected by creationists anyway, because here's the secret. The whole no new information thing is intentionally ambiguous and untestable. It sounds like it's an important point, but when you dig into it, it must either be nothing, or if it means anything at all, it's already known to be false. So on to natural selection. This talk, as I've said earlier, is one given in the Institute for Creation Research conference room. Other than presumably being in Texas, I don't know where that is, but I know it's run, obviously, by the Institute for Creation Research. They stand alone among the major creationist organizations in rejecting natural selection. But let's see what natural selection is and see if there's any good reason to doubt that it occurs. It is fairly obvious that not all organisms have the same reproductive success as other members of their species. For example, I live with three dogs. Two of them have been spayed, and the chances that they will ever reproduce is now zero. But obviously, dogs are in no particular danger of going extinct, and this is because not all dogs are spayed or neutered. But if we look at nature, we can see similar things. For example, let's say we look at organisms that are semiloparous. That is, they only reproduce once, usually at the end of their lives. Female squid are semiloparous, and so any female squid that dies as a result of predation has now entirely failed to reproduce, whereas her fellow female squid, who do reproduce, are obviously more successful at reproducing. But even in iroparous species, that is species that reproduce more than once per lifetime, like most mammals, it's clear that some organisms may be killed before reproducing as many times as another member of the species. So we know reproductive success is relative and varies within any given species. And also, it is clear that organisms also vary in their traits. Among the same species, there is variation in size, proportion, coloration, and many harder to see things such as biochemistry. Clearly, in any given environment, some traits or combinations of traits may lend themselves towards more or less reproductive success. Next, we must link this to genetics. Fortunately, this is easy. Gregor Mendel, the man who more or less invented genetics as a field, already noticed that traits were tied to some underlying mechanism, which was heritable, and that there were certain mathematical relationships between these genes and how traits were realized in the organism. We now know that these genes exist on the DNA, but even if we didn't, we really wouldn't need to. So now we know that the traits which can affect differential reproductive success can be inherited. As a result, those organisms with the highest reproductive success will pass on their traits to a higher proportion of the next generation than those organisms with less reproductive success. That's all natural selection is. Traits vary, and some traits result in better reproductive success. This changes the next generation to be better suited to the environment in which those traits lead to better reproductive success. It's hard to imagine how you could reject this without 
rejecting the basics of genetics, and not just modern genetics, but like 19th century Mendelian genetics are all you need to conclude that this must work. In fact, in analogous situations involving genetic algorithms, you can use this idea of variable traits and reproductive success to train AIs to complete tasks or design mechanical devices or vehicles using a computerized version of natural selection. There's a lot of problems with this. First of all, we don't see we don't see a mechanism for evolution happening right now. Oh, so I suppose the Lensky long-term Ascaria coli experiment doesn't exist. I guess apple maggot flies in North America aren't speciating as I type this. I guess nylonase doesn't exist. Oh wait, yes, all of those things are real. Evolution is happening right now, both in the lab and in the wild. And I guess the man who can't math, Jeffrey P. Tompkins, either doesn't know this or is just lying. Do We don't see DNA actually creating new useful information. Oh man, if only we knew what information was or how to measure it. Since we don't, I guess this is meaningless. We see mutations basically degrading DNA. In other words, we see devolution, not evolution. I see. So I guess the aforementioned evolution of an antifreeze glycoprotein was degradation. Of what, I'm not sure, since the original trypsinogen gene is still intact. Maybe gaining new genes, not losing old ones, and gaining a new function allowing an organism to survive in a novel environment counts as degradation. But if so, I don't see what's wrong with degradation. And also, that's a very non-standard use of the word. Or if we'd like another example, there's always the famous sit plus line of E. coli from the also aforementioned long-term E. coli experiment. They evolved the novel ability to metabolize citrate in the presence of oxygen while not losing the metabolic pathway to metabolize citrate anaerobically. I guess gaining a new metabolic pathway is a loss of information, somehow. And of course, when we look at the fossil record, we see no evolution occurring uh, in the past, nor we do we see any evolution occurring now. Well, first, this is not exactly a peer-reviewed work. The point of conferences is to sort of toss ideas at the wall in front of scientific colleagues and peers and get initial feedback, and then the presenters take that feedback and incorporate it into their research, which ideally is then published. Second, I, as well as I'm sure most evolutionary biologists, would reject the idea that stochastic mutations cannot cause genetic novelty and complexity for the simple reason that We've seen it happen in real time. Third, Tompkins is implying that this article is implying that there is some great problem for evolution here. Let's read it to see if that is really the conclusion that they have reached. And the article is fairly short, so I'll quote it in full. For more than half a century, it has been accepted that new genetic information is mostly derived from random error-based events. Now, it is recognized that errors cannot explain genetic novelty and complexity. Empirical evidence establishes the crucial role of non-random genetic content editors such as viruses and RNA networks to create genetic novelty, complex regulatory control, inheritance vectors, genetic identity, immunity, new sequence space, evolution of complex organisms, and evolutionary transitions. Genetic identities of RNA stem loop groups, RNA networks, such as, for example, group 1 introns, group 2 introns, viroids, RNA viruses, retrotransposons, LTRs, non-LTRs, and subviral networks such as SINEs, LINEs, ALUs, invade and even persist in host genomes. Also, mixed consortia of RNA and DNA virus-derived parts that integrate into host genomes have been found. Highly dynamic RNA protein networks such as ribosome, editosome, and spliceosome generate a large variety of results out of DNA content. Genome-invading agents such as viruses and RNA networks represent a very large and dynamic source of genetic novelty. They can cooperate, build communities, generate nucleotide sequences de novo, and insert or delete them into host genetic content. Viruses and RNA networks often remain as mobile genetic elements or similar defectives and determine host genetic identities throughout all kingdoms, including the virosphere. But inclusion of a transmissive viral biology differs fundamentally from conventional thinking in that it represents a vertical domain of life, providing vast amounts of linked information not derived from direct ancestors. This new empirically-based perspective on the evolution of genetic novelty will have more explanatory power in the future than the error replication narrative of the last century. So it seems that Dr. Tompkins is quote mining here. The article is trying to impress upon us the importance of things that are not so random as copying errors during DNA replication, such as viral insertion, DNA repeats, etc. This is a far cry from supporting Dr. Tompkins' assertion that there is no mechanism for evolution or that it is not occurring now. I find it hard to believe that he read this article, understood it, and then used the quote here in an honest way. Once again, it's hard to see how Dr. Tompkins isn't just a liar. Honestly, why do creationists put up with such dishonesty? I guess maybe they don't check, but at some point, some of them must wonder why it is that to defend their positions, they have to lie so much. As a rule, you don't need to lie to defend things that are true. And in fact, evolutionists themselves are now recognizing that there's huge problems in their model for evolution. This is actually um, some information that I got from a, a conference in 2018. It's, the name of the conference was Evolution. But look what they said on the website. 
And uh, they said for more than half a century, it has been accepted that new genetic information is mostly derived from random error-based events or mutation. Now it is recognized that errors cannot explain genetic novelty and complexity. Let me address Dr. Tompkins directly. Is that what the article said, Dr. Tompkins? You f***ing mendacious a You and the horse you rode in on, you perfidious piece of sh I read that damn article and you were just lying. You lied about the article or you lied by implying you actually read it. As that's what a citation implies. You should be ashamed of yourself. But you're a creationist and you managed to stay that way after getting an actual biology PhD. So we already know your shameless filth. This is why I do this. You and your corrupt conspirators lied to my face for decades and I trusted all of you. Why would these good God-fearing people lie to me? On the other hand, those godless atheists are probably just trying to trick me into sin, I thought. Turns out, nope, it was the creationists lying to me, and the people who weren't creationists weren't even the godless heathens they were portrayed as. I don't know if you can tell, dear audience, but this is the kind of thing that really gets to me. This level of intellectual fraud should be caused to absolutely ostracize Tompkins from not just the academic community, which has largely already happened, but it should be enough to get him expelled from any Christian group to which he belongs, until it can be shown that he has repented and reformed his behavior. Instead, he's celebrated for his blatant lies. I guess his version of Christianity has just decided to ignore the Ninth Commandment. Weird then how many of them want to put up the Ten Commandments outside of courthouses if they don't even like one of the least controversial commandments among them. Maybe Tompkins isn't bad at math after all. Maybe he's just so dishonest he doesn't feel like he needs to bother to even get basic arithmetic right, since no creationist will check him on it, and of course he can safely ignore real scientists. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but I still think his mathematical incompetence is better explained by just that incompetence than it is by malice. But at this point, malice is at least much more likely and definitely on the table. I'll be honest, this is my first time responding to Tompkins that I can remember, and I started out this video series being optimistic that he was just bad at his job, as I usually do with creationists. I really get tired of being disappointed by this. I know at this point I should just expect all the PhD young earth creationists to just be outright liars, but I can't bring myself to be that pessimistic about people even Young Earth creationists. It's happened with John Sanford, who I was ready to have a high opinion of based on Sal Cordova's estimation of the man. It's happened with Andrew Snelling, and boy is he ever dishonest. It's happened with Stephen Meyer, and now it's happening with Jeffrey Tompkins. Oh well. I guess maybe it's time for me to just adjust my expectations and be pleasantly surprised anytime I can find some shred of a possibility that a creationist professional is just incompetent rather than dishonest. Alright, that's as much as I can handle for today. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, hit the like button. If you didn't, tell me what you didn't like in the comments and hit the dislike button. Either way, I hope you hit the subscribe button and use the bell icon to turn on all notifications so you're always alerted when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Bent Hovind, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mabity Babity, San, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, Eloran Teller, Dr. Tapioca Weasel, and Pat L. Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is. And perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get an access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.